I'm Sid Mendelson. I'm the director of the division. On my immediate right is Bob Holden, chief of the branch of investment company inspection. Uh, on his right is Mike Parker, financial analyst of our division. On my far left is Dennis Gertz, the division's examination program coordinator. And on his right <clears throat> is Frank Morrison, chief of the Office of Examination of the New York Regional Office. Now, for this session, we're going to discuss books and records. I, I think I should emphasize that uh, books and records are not an end to themselves. That, in my view, uh, they should be looked at as tools to the inspection program. The books and records requirements have been designed to make it as easy as is practical to obtain the necessary information to conduct a good inspection program. It also helps the company uh, put in, give, supply their information in such a way, or record their information in such a way that they can retrieve it at the most expedient way possible. Without any further discussion, turn it over to Dennis. Okay, we'll start off with uh, an overview of the uh, accounting system of an investment company. We're not going to be able to teach a, a non-accountant uh, how to uh, keep a set of books or uh, even audit a set of books in the, even an hour or two hours here. What we'll try to do first is have Mike Parker sketch through the, the very basics of an accounting system that you'd find in the average investment company. Uh, then we'll spend a majority of our time not reciting line by line what the requirements are under uh, rules under 31, uh, section uh, rule 31A1, but we'll use those rules, we'll go down uh, category by category and try to discuss in a in an open panel here, and that's why we've changed the format a little bit, uh, what you would expect to find and what you could find and what has been found in the past using uh, various records. So, uh, Mike, why don't you start off with uh, the accounting system. The, the Rule 31 books and records requirement uh, was adopted at the same time as the Commission was empowered to routinely inspect investment companies. Now, the books and records that we're going to be discussing are, at times, the same books and records that any company would maintain. They're fundamental to the operations and would, would be maintained even if there wasn't a statutory requirement. Other records, however, are really not what you'd see in a normal company. And they, in all likelihood, well, I know they wouldn't, would not keep them. They're designed not for the company, for the management of the company, but rather to permit an easy and fast overview of the, op of the operations of the company by examiners such as yourself. Before we uh, go into discussing these books and records, I'd like to, I think we should first uh, talk very briefly about the uh, about what you're going to find when you go into an investment company. And I think if you if you break an investment company down into its components, you can better relate those components to the books and records uh, which they're which are trying to describe them. Now, I I would I break an investment company down into first that segment dealing with investments or portfolio management. Second, related to that, is the brokerage allocation aspect. Uh, in some cases, this will involve an actual trader where, they, where they'll take uh, the, portfolio manage, the, the portfolio securities and actually place the orders on the market. The third is the transfer agent function, the buying and selling of fund shares. And then the fourth 
is just the is the general uh, safeguard of funds assets a more the, the uh, a general category now if you if you think if you keep these if you keep these four factors in mind these four functions in mind uh, first when you go into a company and second when you're thinking about about the books and records we're going to discuss I, I think you'll you'll have a, a a broader understanding of what's going on and hopefully we'll be able to spot problem areas because this is what we're dealing with these four areas it, it's fairly easy to see when you think of, when you think of these areas the types of problems that that can can evolve there's a a high, a high degree of trust involved in the operation of an investment company and that's what these books and records are designed to, to do to make sure that 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 those involved in the management of the investment company are living up to that degree of trust. Now, the only other thing I can think of to say in terms of of a uh, an introduction is that there are two general types of records maintained: journals and ledgers. <clears throat> if you can switch to the uh, to the uh, slide, <clears throat> here we have. In the slide, we're we're looking at a uh, a manually produced system. You'll see at the beginning are all input data coming into the system. The first <coughs> record that is maintained of of these uh, documents are the journals. Journals are the record of of original entry. A journal is nothing more than what you might uh, phrase a, a diary of all activity. It's a, chrono it's a chronological record of anything and everything that happens in the life of an investment company. Following the journal, the data goes to, a, to various ledgers. We have the general ledger, which is a record of all accounts, and then we have auxiliary ledgers. Auxiliary ledgers, by and large, almost totally, are ledgers that have been set up for the purposes of reviewing the operations of the investment company. These are the ones I referred to earlier as being for our purposes alone. And then from, from the general ledger uh, comes the trial balance and the financial statements, the pulling of account totals. I think now we're ready, uh, Dennis, to, uh, to move over to a general to a more specific discussion of the uh, various records maintained. Do you want to show them the, uh, the automated uh, okay. system slightly different? The, the automated sl system is slightly different, primarily in that the journals and general ledger are produced at the same time. Uh, there is, because the, the data is being fed onto a tape into a computer, there is no need to go to, a, to the intermediate step of creating the journals the journal and general ledger will uh, spew forth at the same time. I don't think there's any other difference than that. Gentlemen, how, uh, uh, how many funds uh, would be keeping their records uh, by computer today rather than in the, or in the old way? Well, I, I would say that the one area that almost all funds, over 25 million, uh, use a computer is on the uh, is in the area of investments, as far as maintaining a record of investment securities. And Frank or Bob, and shareholder you records, as w shareholder share accounting system, shareholder yeah. records to a slight degree less. Uh, and then in the area of the general ledger, which is maintaining the basic accounts, I would say you'd be surprised that probably less than 30 percent uh, keep it on computer even some very large operations is that your that's, experience that's, that's, in the that's, Washington that's, office? That's, still post by hand that's probably your experience true. in the New yeah. York office yeah. is I saying? think too that uh, you have to look to the region in which the investment companies are located and the the servicing agents for investment companies for example I know for a fact in the Boston area there's a, a large complex of companies all serviced by one particular company and in, in those situations, or in those instances, almost all of the records are automated. So I think what I'm trying to say is that uh, uh, you have to really look also to the region. Uh, you're, like le you're less likely to find automated systems perhaps out in 
uh, out in the hinterlands as you are in the, the larger metropolitan cities. Well, now, more and more, I think, uh, the centrally located, the, the big banks in New York and Boston are uh, becoming servicing agents for funds all over the country. Right. So, I mean, you may have a situation where all the records are kept in Boston or New York, even though the funds in Iowa or Minneapolis or whatever. Right. That's right. Regardless of, of what it is today, the trend certainly has to be to computers, and it's just something that uh, the examination staff is going to have to live with from now on, and uh, uh, we're going to find it more and more. So, uh, no matter, I, I don't think it makes much difference what it is today. I think you, you know, uh, uh, almost everybody of any size uses some some form of computer system or other. Uh -huh. It may be a very limited sense, but at least some computer. Uh, Bob, uh, those uh, companies that have used computer systems. Uh, do you find that there are enough records at the company's premises for you to examine the books and records there? Uh, we have, uh, uh, it's been our experience that, that companies that, that use these agents, uh, they get enough information uh, each day that we have been able to always get the information that we, uh, that we desire in order to complete the examination. Uh, we have, uh, uh, in one instance, uh, in retrospect, I wish we had gone to Boston to go to the uh, to the agent. Uh, we had enough information to do it, but it would have just, uh, you know, there was it had to do with some some with a book or record or something. It wasn't it was nothing of uh, of substance uh, in terms of violation. It was I just wasn't sure whether they were uh, producing a record that they would have been required to produce on site, and it, it really at that point wasn't enough. But I think the next time I do that company, we're going to go to Boston. Is that your experience? Yeah, too, generally, Frank? the companies in New York uh, have written into their agreements with servicing agents uh, uh, provisions for their uh, production of hard copy, either periodically or upon request. And, uh, and uh, so far, uh, it hasn't presented any real problems for us. So that are you able to complete an in inspection normally uh, without going to the service agent, which may may be out of town? Generally, we are. Under special circumstances, uh, we may uh, go directly to the servicing agent. But it depends on the kind of problems that are triggered during the course of the examination. For purely books and records purposes, or for determinations of compliance with the bookkeeping rules, we found we find generally that the the hard copy that they have in their offices uh, are generally sufficient uh, for our purposes. Okay. I think it might be wise. I, okay. I just you know, with respect to computers, it's not so much uh, that people use computers, but when when they did, and I just as a, as a kind of an overview, uh, it's it's been my experience that uh, that when you go to do an examination of an investment company, that there's no two that keep books alike. You know, I've never found any two that that I could that I could walk into and 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 I'd have something stored away that would that I'd know exactly what their system was. Everybody has it uh, sufficiently to their own. Uh, uh, even it's it's amazing. Even when they seem to have use an agent, uh, they they have certain things that are geared just to them enough to uh, to, 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 to to change the whole. And it takes it. Uh, uh, I don't really care what the experience of the examiner is, it's going to take at least a couple of days just to find out what the system that they're using, just to become acquainted enough with it to really begin to really find your way around and, and, yeah, and what I they use. I think you'll find that the, with the use of common agents, uh, the, the agents offer different kinds of they packages, do. accounting packages, uh, depending upon the size of the company and the company's particular needs. And I think one of the factors that the, the company considers, obviously, is an economic one. You might find it useful that uh, that when you first go in and uh, and you put in contact with the uh, uh, with the people that do that are in charge of the accounting, uh, to have them take and run through uh, everything that they use, if they can just kind of gather a sampling of every all their uh, of their system together. Uh, and one of the things that that it it's uh, it's been found uh, uh, useful for is that invariably uh, these little. Uh, uh, systems that they have developed just for them uh, have a very useful purpose for them and while they're not necessarily encompassed within our books and records requirements uh, it's going to help you to examine because if it's important enough for them to want a certain record then it really means something to them and it's it and it has a very you know it has a definite purpose and, and it's going to help you to, to find out what you want to find out so uh, uh, but the, the trouble with computer systems is that you get so much detail 
that and you have to and it's and it's all it seems like everything's on a, on an in, on an individual piece of paper and you have to take and put all of that together and it, it it's it's when, when it was a manual system it, it really in some ways was much easier because everything was kind of laid out and you could see everything at one at one at one stroke where now you have to take and pull from a lot of different sources in order to get all the information that you want in in some ways it's much more difficult you find Do you have a comment <laughs> I was going to say, while you do find uh, that, that the systems differ quite a bit, I've always found that there is a great deal of similarity. And I think as you begin to look at, at companies, look for the similarities. Try to understand the entire system. The system should be logical. You should be able to follow what they call in accounting the paper trail uh, th through the system. And if you can't, fi if you can't follow it, ask them, uh, to explain the problems that you have, uh, to, to answer the questions that you may have. You should be able to follow the thing through. That's the recording of execution, right up the line to the ultimate settlement. Right. Sid mentioned it in the very beginning of the session here, but I think I want to reiterate uh, maybe a little bit differently. That, as I understand it, uh, the inspection is not an audit of the mutual fund. Uh, we are not taking the place or duplicating the efforts of the auditors that are required under Section 32 to do the audit. It's up to them to, to verify that the system is uh, of internal controls is adequate to produce the, uh, the kind of records and the, uh, the kind of accuracy that's necessary. We're using 32, uh, 31A as a checklist to make sure they have the required records and then you start from there and looking at the details to see what they mean uh, see that they're compliance with all their policies and all the other uh, restrictions that we've spent you know, many hours so far uh, enumerating it. But it's in the records that are supposed to document the operations of the investment company. The records are just a springboard. You know, that, that you're only going to use those to, 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 to take where these people live. Uh, you know, they, just like Sid said, they're not an end in themselves. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, you, you just, you know, you go through them as part. And uh, I think, well, unless you found some egregious case. In most instances, when we get finished with an examination, uh, uh, any books and records problems are of a you know, technical nature. They're missing this, they're missing that. Uh, uh, you, know, you, you could have a case come from that, but by and large, it's, uh, it, there's some small things that are out of line as, and, as opposed to uh, any, uh, any type of egregious type of violation. We should, make, we should make sure, though, that the books and records do permit a good overview of the operation. We want them to, we want them to, to, to function for our purposes uh, so that the next time somebody goes in there, they'll be able to take a look at it and, and see, uh, and, and it'll be ready, readily avail, uh, available to them. The records will be readily available, and, and they'll provide the, the, the sort of detail that's asked for by the rule. Meaning we cite the violation and we look for oh, the yeah. correction. Absolutely, but I'm, yeah. I'm saying is that that I understand that they're of a t more of a technical nature rather than substance, by and large. Do you have any questions on the overview before we get into some of the specifics? Okay, why don't we start out with the uh, the books of original entry, the uh, the journals, and just uh, uh, go down these. Uh, there's several different types of journals. Uh, we've got. Some of them on the slide now. Purchases and sales of portfolio securities, uh, sales and redemptions of the fund shares, that's to their shareholders. Uh, all receipts and deliveries of the securities, including serial numbers. This would be a recording of the you know, paper coming in and out, the, the stock certificates uh, in dollars. Uh, the receipts and disbursements of cash and uh, all other debits and credits. Uh, you can look at 31 and it enumerates you know, the kinds of things that have to be in a journal, but uh, anybody have any comments on the kinds of things uh, you look at uh, here? Well, very carefully you should be looking at the receipts and disbursements of cash. The, uh, the other items that uh, you've enumerated are somewhat of a mechanical kind of uh, uh, writing medium, if you will. Uh, the guts of the operation goes really to what the what the investment company is doing with the cash that the shareholders are pumping into it. Not only from the standpoint of buying and selling portfolio securities or or selling or redeeming its own shares, but 
uh, what else is it doing with this cache? And this journal clearly should show you uh, precisely what the disbursements are to the extent that the investment company disperses its own cash. Very often in, 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 uh, in uh, instances of uh, checking disbursements of cash, it might, may well lead you to the custodian who uh, merely acts uh, in place of the investment company solely for that purpose. Huh? The, the custodian uh, very often acts upon advices given to it directly by the investment company. It usually acts upon written advices which uh, authorize the disbursements of, uh, of cash and monies to, to various people, entities, brokers, dealers, uh, for various payments of the kind of bills that are generated by investment companies. Uh, the normal kinds of cash payments or disbursements we don't really have too much of a problem with except when you find the payments of cash or disbursements of cash going to, to entities or vendors for other purposes that perhaps uh, other affiliates of the investment company should be paying. Will these stand out in a, in a really automated system? I mean, would you be able to uh, see immediately that they were paying uh, lots of legal fees or do you have to look in a number of different places for something like that? I, I think we're, we're those type the, the types of things you're talking about, you're going to go first to the ledger. I don't want to get ahead of us, but I, I think you're going to go first to the ledger, and then you're going to be you become concerned with a period of time, and that's when the journals come into play because they are set up in a chronological fashion, and then you can go back and look at at points in time. I think that's your that's going to be one of your your, your lar largest use of a journal is to look at points in time. This, this is like a jumping off point because we hit, we're on the first we're on the first record, and uh, uh, you know, and I can think of, you know, in, in some situations where I'd agree with you, and in other situations where exactly the the opposite would be, and you'd have to go look at the journals. Uh, if you're in a uh, 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 if the general ledger and 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 many times the general ledger is the let, let's say travel uh, expense. And, and that's a big thing you're looking for is you want to go and analyze what the expenses of the investment company are because there's many times when uh, uh, they're not illegal expenses but they're expenses that should be borne by somebody other than the investment company uh, a lot of times the investment advisor will uh, uh, will uh, will just uh, uh, you know where he can especially the uh, 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 he'll just uh, he'll charge off to the investment companies uh, uh, certain expenses uh, I, I think you also that, that there are many investment companies now that, that have uh, checking accounts that, that where they traditionally in the past uh, it was always where the custodian uh, on advice paid expenses. Uh, but more and more, especially since the 70 amendments, uh, where they're allowed to have checking accounts uh, up to the amount of their bond, uh, that the investment company itself will dispense uh, uh, by check. Uh, and you have to look much more carefully then. Well then, you're Bob, like, what, what you're saying is that you'd look at the You'd look at the investment advisory agreement before you went in. You have, well, and, and, or, and, or, or initially, and, and and you would and you would and then you would see who was bearing uh, under the contract, who was bearing what expenses, exactly. right. and knowing that, then you, when you went into the journal or went into the ledger and you saw expenses which you recall should be paid by somebody else, you'd raise a question. Is well, that it may, it may not even be it not, may not even be that clear. It may be. That, uh, for instance, uh, uh, let's say prospectuses, uh, the investment company can uh, can uh, legitimately uh, bear the expenses of uh, prospectuses that may be, uh, for one reason or another, uh, mailed to shareholders. Uh, but on the other hand, so uh, we had a, just an examination recently uh, in Pennsylvania where the uh, where the investment where and it wasn't even a total. The uh, the investment company was uh, bearing four fifths of the expense, and the advisor was bearing a fifth. Well, they had. Uh, out of 5,000 shareholders, well, they were printing 10,000 prospectuses, or 10,000, 10,000, whatever it was. So clearly, uh, the uh, you know uh, the, the the investment company could say bear half of that. You know, uh, you know, it's not always where the it's it's clearly something that should be borne by the advisor or something borne by the investment company. You, you have to really sit and analyze it. You have well, to then, sit and look at it. So that your inspection, even before you looked at the records, would be facilitated if you had studied the documents uh, in the files of the commission before you made the, the visit. Is that Precisely. correct? Not only the prospectus, but also the operable agreement. Yeah. Because very often it spells out not only the terms of the uh, agreement, the amounts to be paid, 
under the agreement, but the dates at which particular payments should be made and to the extent that it contains an expense limitation, okay, the, the uh, examiner should also look to, to, to make a determination whether there is any prepayment of advisory fees, as well as to make sure that the, the, the payments don't go beyond the, uh, the amounts prescribed in the agreement. Let me ask you a technical question, something you had uh, brought up before, uh, Frank. Let's assume that uh, there is a custodianship by a bank and, the, um, and there is a purchase or a sale of a security. The bank dispenses the cash and takes in the security. Will that show up on the, the journals in the company's records? The payment, therefore, will. And what about the receipt of the uh, and, and and will the receipt of the uh, uh, will the receipt of the in, uh, of the security show up in the same journal? Uh, I think that uh, to, to answer you, it's a, it's a hard question to answer for this reason. There are, there are two ways that that custodians operate, and and two two ways that investment companies operate in this particular area. The first is that the uh, investment company. Uh, when it executes a transaction, might post it immediately to their investment ledger and set up a payable or receivable uh, with respect to the cash, depending upon whether it's a purchase or a sale. Uh, and then when the custodian physically pays uh, for the security, the investment company will receive an advice from the custodian so stating. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that the custodian has in fact received the security. It may have a fail on its books, but acting as the investment <laughs> company's agent for the purposes of, of uh, uh, collecting dividends on that particular security, the onus is really on the custodian to, to make sure that all monies due the, the, the investment company at this stage are collected. Mm -hmm. So w what I'm suggesting is that uh, the security, although it's reflected as being owned by the investment company, it may well not have been received yet by the custodian. And this is a normal situation. It's a normal kind of a situation. It's yeah. a normal the, kind of a the situation. The custodian gets the benefit of the float also. That's yeah. true. Some companies may See, on the other hand, on the other hand, the investment company may not reflect the disbursement of cash until the security is actually received by the custodian. Mm. I, I'd say more frequently. It's more frequently, first, you'll it's find the, the latter to, to, to be the case. But on occasion, you do find you know rare instances where there's some little nuances in their accounting system that 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 seem to throw the examiner. That, that they just don't quite understand it, particularly when it, when you get into the era of reconciliation of securities and cash, and and it, they really the procedures really show up when when you're trying to make that kind of a reconciliation. I don't know if I've answered your question. I, yes, I sort of in other words, what you're saying is that if, if the fund, in many instances where the fund has uh, uh, gotten a confirmation or gotten advice from the, from the broker that the securities were bought or sold, he makes, though, he makes an entry showing, uh, uh, crediting the shares on his books. Precisely. And, and uh, in, in many instances, if not all, mm -hmm. He uh, shows a, 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 a cash deduction. Right. And so even though none of these yeah. things have actually physically happened yet. Right, right. They do, the, this, they do this for the purposes of controlling the price makeup sheet, which is, mm -hmm. which is done on a daily basis. They don't wait till the settlement date to include a security. That's very uh, important. Uh, on their uh, price right. makeup sheet. So the accounting methods, I think what, what comes out here is the accounting methods are somewhat orthodox in the sense that... Uh, the companies take constructive possession of a security before it's even received by the custodian. It's true, cruel accounting. It's a cruel accounting, yeah. yes, but... Uh, Otherwise, you couldn't have a current net asset value. value. Some funds do identify, though, for their records, the location of the securities. They'll, yeah. have, secur they'll have an actual account set up, securities in transit, Yeah. Uh, securities in possession. Mm. Although I think there, you see less and less very, of it today. Very few of them that do that. Right. For those examiners who are familiar with brokerage accounting, the, the, the accounting concept there is just the opposite. Nothing gets recorded until the settlement date. Right. Here, everything gets recorded on the trade date. Right. It's really the day after the trade date, isn't it? Well, yeah. yeah. Well, I, that always threw me. Uh, well, the rule requires them to do it the day after the trade. Yeah, date, they but could they, do they it. They can do it on the trade date. But it's almost, from any big outfit, it's almost impossible 
uh, they, they get their confirmations late, they don't know whether they sold them, so, that, so that in order to make the price makeup sheet, if a transaction happened the last sale of a, uh, on the New York Stock Exchange to dramatize the situation, it would be very difficult to, uh, f uh, to, to, to put that in, your, in the price makeup sheet as received at that time. So that the, the the statute recognizes that and gives them an extra day. An extra day to do it. Mm -hmm. So ahead. if you specifically, if you sell 100 shares of General Motors today at uh, 60 dollars a share, nothing happens in the uh, that day as to that trade. No. The next morning, when you get the confirmation from the broker, you know how much the commission was and everything. Then you put it into the accounting system, and it's reflected on that day as a. You sold it. You'd have the receivable for the cash, and you take the security off of your records. While we're talking about price makeup sheets, I think we should say that that investment companies should operate under an accrual method of accounting, which means that when an, an expense is incurred, not necessarily when the cash payment uh, is made, that expense should be reflected on the uh, funds uh, books, and the deduction made from the funds pool of monies from the fund's net asset value. Well, again, you know, and, and I, that there, there are many funds that, that may not do that, but what they'll do is they'll set up a daily uh, lump accrual that they've, they've, they've determined that, that their general expenses, income and expenses of uh, our, us, you know, their accountants usually will determine uh, X number of dollars and they'll every day, they'll just, they'll just add that. To the, uh, the or, or deduct or deducted from well, uh, it all you know, comes out in the works the same yes. way. Right, right. The difference right. should be less than a penny a share. Yeah, yeah well, that's well, that's it, it has to be done. Uh, it, it, well, Otherwise, you'd two have eight, eight, you'd have two major eight, changes. Rule two eight forty one, which which determines the we're getting into net asset value, but that that uh, covers that. What two eight forty one? Isn't it? Four. Four. 41 is the rule. 2A41 is the rule, and yeah. 2A4 is, I mean, 2A41 is the section, and 2A4 is the rule. Oh, all right. 2A41. <laughs> what do I know? Uh, anything else? Oh, We've mean. killed ledgers uh, or uh, journals. Uh, mm -hmm. Moving on to ledgers. Uh, yeah, the general ledger, which Mike's already talked about a little bit, and basically this would be all the accounts uh, of, the corp of the fund debit should equal the credits, okay? Very fundamental there. Uh, we'd have all the assets, all the liabilities, and uh, the capital or the shareholders' equity. Also have all the uh, income and expense accounts. Uh, you also have uh, auxiliary, auxiliary uh, ledgers, securities in transit, uh, as Mike was pointing out, keeping track of these. Uh, securities held physically, uh, those that are in the custodian or whatever, uh, securities borrowed or loaned, uh, money borrowed or loaned, dividends and interest received, and dividends and interest accrued. Now these are usually kept chronologically within each ledger, is that right, Dennis? Uh, well, by account. By account by yes. Logically. In other words, uh, let's take uh, let's take the uh, let's take the securities account. You have a general securities ledger, would you say, and then a separate ledger for each security? Is that right? Well, I have a separate ledger account for each security. We'll get to that. Yeah. Uh, pointing out a couple of things to kick things off. Uh, get deeper. Uh, securities in transit. This would identify fails. I mean, if you had some, uh, if you had a security in transit for more than five days, which would be the normal settlement time, five to seven days, if it went over a weekend, uh, you'd have an indication of a fail. That is, if you bought the security, whoever you bought it from failed to deliver it to you on time. And in an investment company, the cash doesn't get transferred by the custodian until the security is uh, physically delivered. But if the uh, but this is a danger signal, is it not? If the security is starting to move uh, in the marketplace, uh, uh, either up or down, uh, it, it it it's an indication that if the fund is being is watching that, it it, it should move at a certain point to eradicate that fail or to do something about it. Isn't that true? I don't, they're probably not at risk because uh, you know, they're dealing generally with you know, substantive broker dealers. But I guess you know they would. If something was outstanding for ten days, they'd probably be on the phone every uh, every day until they got the. the what it might what it might serve to do is to identify a, 
a severe back office problem on the part of a broker yeah. dealer. If, That's right. If and if uh, you find that an investment company, for example, would use the same broker continuously and accumulate it in an inordinate amount of uh, fails, uh, we've seen this happen on uh, on, a, on a few occasions in New York, and uh, as you are all well aware of, a couple of companies have gone under up in New York. That's right. Well, so. if, if, if a company, if you went into an investment company, Frank, uh, and you looked at, its, uh, at, at that ledger and it showed uh, uh, an inordinate amount of fails, particularly in one broker, uh, what would your reaction be? Very nervous. You'd probably pick up your phone and That's call right. your counterpart on the broker-dealer side within the commission and have them send an inspection team. And uh, right. and uh, would you, if, if you had these fails, which means, of course, that the company hasn't, the investment company hasn't received either its cash or its securities, if it's a purchase, if if they're expecting securities, they haven't received them yet. Uh, the company is at risk, is it not? It certainly is. Uh, because if the market goes up, uh, they, they haven't. They uh, they have a paper record of the that that they had them, but the but uh, you can't sell a paper record in the sense that uh, they have a claim against that broker. That's very, seems to me that 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 would be something that the inspector would note. Is would you say that? Oh, most definitely. Most definitely. You'll find in most investment companies, though, that the, the, the recording of payables, receivables, and securities in, in transit accounts are kept mainly by clerks in the company. Now, if, if you had a good supervisor, perhaps in the back office of an investment company, or if the president, or an officer, or, or somebody uh, of a managerial status within the company kept abreast of, kept himself abreast of these kinds of things, when you walked in, you probably wouldn't find this kind of a problem. But invariably, because of the way the records are kept on a pure mechanical basis, the, 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 the likelihood of, of, unless there's very, very close supervision of, of those people making an inquiry before you make the inquiry, is, is nil. We've, we've found this to be the case. So you've you got to be particularly uh, aware of the, the uh, not only the amounts of uh, payables and receivables on the books, but also uh, what they represent. Do they represent one transaction, one trade, and a, a high-price security? A lot of trades and low-price securities? Uh, are they all uh, tra representing transactions that uh, were affected with the same broker? Is there some degree of, of commonality uh, about the monies? And if you come to the conclusion that it is, then you ought to get nervous. And you ought to transfer that nervousness to, to, to your supervisor. I think it's, you, know, you touched on an important, uh, important thought, and that is to, to stand back and, and look at the numbers, you know, see if they're reasonable. Uh, of course, the longer you're on the job, uh, the easier it is for you to spot things that, that, don't, that appear uh, out of line. Did you call but, this a smell <coughs> test, I mean, to right. a great extent? Right. I mean, an experienced examiner mm -hmm. will just be able to know that something's not right. But, but from around. day one, from day one, you know, Using your intuitive judgment, you should be able to sense things that, that don't seem right. You know, if it's a small fund and you see sixty thousand dollars in phone bills, you know, why is it that such a small fund has so large phone bills? It's a real case, right? I'd be excited if a large <laughs> fund had sixty thousand dollars in phone calls. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, I, I think this is a, a good area to to point out uh, where this has some of the similarities of an audit, but it's not an audit. Uh, you go. All of these accounts, the assets, the liabilities, uh, you, you, you take the, the, the amounts and you verify uh, what those amounts are. Break down by amount, age, uh, for instance, let's say accounts payable, uh, uh, as expenses are accrued and they're thrown into accounts payable before they're paid. Well, you have to go back and, and pull them out. Uh, uh, it also helps you to see what type of internal, internal system. The, uh, the the uh, the management has do they have something broken down uh, and usually you, you take the general ledger the trial balance from the most previous month end uh, and that, it it serves a lot of purposes because it's to you tell you define a trial balance excuse me once you define what a trial well balance. I, you know, but but I mean it, what it does is is is, is it helps you to uh, to uh, to see uh, a lot of different things all at one time uh, whether they're current uh, whether they have any systems. Uh, 
uh, what internal controls, uh, it, what, what, the, what are the amounts of these payables, what is the age of them, we're talking about age. Uh, you go into uh, uh, to, uh, security sold, securities purchased, uh, that tells you, what, that gives you uh, very quickly uh, on a current basis what the age, uh, now that may not be sufficient to just look at that one month in, but it may be sufficient, you may see it right then and there. Usually if, if, a, if a company uh, is sloppy, if a company doesn't have good internal controls, if a company is not managed well, it'll show up on a current basis. You don't have to go looking back in a lot of uh, historical documents. It's usually right then, right there. And uh, and and I think this this uh, using using this again as a springboard. Uh, their numbers on a piece of paper, but those numbers mean something. And to take uh, and we and, and now that's the verification. Now where that where the 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 audit aspect of it ends is is that we don't go to the ultimate conclusion of going out to who they owe it to to verify if the if the amounts are accurate. I mean, that's the difference uh, between what we do and what an auditor does. We expect the auditor to go and verify these amounts with the people that uh, uh, that the the monies are owed to or owed from. Right? right. On these, uh, the ledgers we've been talking about, you could also, you should also know what the policies of the fund are uh, before you start looking at them because uh, you'd want to know if they had the ability to, to borrow money bef before you looked at the, the uh, securities uh, or the money borrowed. Uh, you'd also want to know whether they could loan securities before you went into that subject. You know, I would say as a beginning, as a beginning, review the account heading, re review all accounts without even looking to the detail to see if there are any accounts, you know, in and of themselves that raise questions. And mo if there's a money's borrowed account. Uh, when the when the funds investment investment policies do not permit uh, borrowing, that in itself indicates a problem area. Prospectus uh, should be used as a checklist, just like the rules, of, oh, sort of, you know, the 31 rules. You just go down and see if they're doing whatever they say they're doing and not doing what they say they're not going to do. Okay, I should mention the uh, securities ledger accounts. So we have a, a separate ledger card for each. Uh, security. So you'd have a ledger. That's not the exact slide, but it's close. That's uh, some of the other ones. Uh, you'd have a separate ledger card that showed the, the each trade in a given security. So you'd have one card for General Motors. Title of the security. Now, by, the, by the title of the security. Well, now, uh, Frank, in a, in, a, in a case like that, let's take the ledger card, and uh, let's assume that. Uh, uh, you were looking at the 204 forms of the associated persons of the investment advisor and you noticed that they were making uh, were making uh, several trades they reported trades uh, would you uh, would you expect your inspectors to to take a look at those 204 forms in conjunction with what the investment company had done in the at the uh, at in or on or about the same time as the purchases or sales that were being made by the investment advisor or his employees for his own account. In the New York office, we have a separate branch of investment advisor uh, examinations, and they uh, we what we try to do in New York is to schedule an investment advisor examination simultaneously with the examination of an investment company. Uh, if the investment advisor, we, we try to determine before we go in whether the investment advisor has any private clients. The, the record that Sid is speaking about is a 204 uh, 812 record that uh, well, basically the investment with, advisors act. Uh, under the Investment Advisors Act and basically what it is is a record to determine whether there's been any uh, conflicts of interest in, in the affecting of uh, transactions between the employees of an investment advisor vis-a-vis -vis its private clients and vis-a-vis -vis the clients of an affiliated investment company. Now you take all of these three together to determine whether or not any one of them have been disadvantaged or alternatively advantaged to somebody else's disadvantage. It's, uh, In other words, if they showed uh, that they had purchased XYZ fund, uh, XYZ company, uh, and they had made numerous large purchases or large and then subsequently large sales, for example, 
it wouldn't be uncommon for you to go to the ledger of the investment company and see what the investment company was doing at the same time. We would uh, normally do that kind of a test check. So that, and this was the place you'd look at it because you could get all of the purchases of the, uh, uh, and sales of that investment company on almost one card. Precisely. You'd see it immediately. Precisely. You'd be what? looking for churning too. It should yeah. come out just crystal clear if they're churning in a given Certainly. Security. So you'd be looking. And selling, so you, and by going selling. through the ledger, uh, those special ledgers of investment company of the investment company, you could determine uh, to a large extent. Uh, whether they were churning in the same securities, purchase and selling, within a very short period of time. By way of technique, uh, if, if you'll uh, uh, spare me a few minutes, one of the techniques that we use up in the New York office to, 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 to determine that is we look at the 204 record, and from that record, to the if it's extensive, and if we find that the employees are doing a lot of trading, as well as... Uh, there is a, an inordinate amount of trading in the private clients' accounts. What we do is we prepare a card for each security, and generally the, 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 the time, because we're really working in a time frame, uh, uh, at what time were these securities purchased and by whom? Now, these cards are related to the ledger accounts in the investment company to determine whether or not there's been any... Uh, uh, overreaching on the part of the advisor and or his clients and particularly on part of the advisor's employees. The, the, uh, where you're going to find the problems will be in that particular area. You'll find that uh, the employees who have uh, knowledge as to uh, what kind of securities the investment company may be buying or selling and the kinds of securities that the, the investment advisor is recommending to be purchased to his clients or to the extent that it has uh, trading authority, full trading authority over the client's accounts can, can uh, uh, buy securities before they either recommend them or purchase them for the private client accounts in the hope to drive the price of the security up and then sub subsequently sell them at a profit. This is a technique that's called scalping. And, uh, it's even easier now with options. Uh, much easier with options. And uh, one of the techniques, as I said before, is, is the use of a card system, which we find uh, uh, very helpful. After you get the information on the cards and you prepare a card for each security, it's a very simple kind of a th an operation. You merely put it in alphabetical order and relate it to the investment ledger of an investment company, which by and large is also kept in alphabetical order. So once, once you've got all these three components, you spread before you, you can readily see the extent to which there may have been some overreaching on anybody's part. Bob, uh, you don't have the luxury of departmentalizing investment advisors and investment companies such as Frank uh, does and, and other large of the larger regional offices. Now, would you schedule uh, an inspection uh, uh, of the investment advisor at the same time you're inspecting the investment company? Uh, our practice is to, is to uh, uh, if there's an investment company complex and they have an advisor, a broker-dealer, uh, whatever's there, we do. Uh, all at once. We send, we, we send a, a team in and they'll do the whole, they'll do the complex. And would you, uh, and would you, uh, uh, and during the course of that inspection, would you compare the 204 forms with the ledger account? Yes. Right. That's all so part that, of that. So all, that you're doing, you're that. really doing, doing the, the same, same thing, thing with Absolutely. one team, Absolutely. and you are doing it with, with two, two teams. teams. Yeah. But so you're coming to the same conclusion. Right. Yeah. Okay. And uh, an associated area is where, we ha where you go in and you have an insurance company managed complex of funds. And here you'll have the uh, insurance companies being very actively involved in the securities market. In many cases, uh, dealing in the same, similar, the same securities as the investment companies. And this creates a real problem because uh, you may have a very, very large entity uh, involving many securities, and putting these these two lists of securities or, or six or eight lists of securities together can be a very, very uh, complex thing. When you're doing the American General Complex, didn't you ask them for a consolidated computer run of all their trading of all their entities? Dennis is referring to a, a, a case of about two or three years ago where we had 
a very large complex of funds. I think at that time they had... still the largest, isn't they it, had, in terms of number of funds? In terms of numbers of funds, it is. They had, well, it's been it's reducing, but they had a, roughly 24 investment companies and a very large insurance company. Fortunately there, they had a, an in-house uh, computer facility, and we were able, by asking them, to produce a run which detailed holdings of all, by security of all entities, so that uh, it basically did the work for us. So you could see purchase, simultaneous purchase and sales. That's correct. You could D see a, a front run, and you could see if somebody was buying before the fund went in, and then and then uh, when the fund conceivably, if the fund, the pressure of the fund on the market when it, it when it went into a buying period, the market may well go up. And if and you would notice if the if the insider sold immediately thereafter at the high that the fund created, you would see the scalping situation then, wouldn't you? Well, the situation would be would be that they were trying to favor one entity over the, one corporate well, entity over the other. That you could do. I mean, it didn't it, consolidate the individuals involved. It didn't consolidate the 204 funds, but it did go a long way. It would show you what the general account for You could see whether the ins insurance, insurance company, company was being, was being uh, favored right. as against the, the investment companies. We had a, uh, a complex, uh, the Federated Complex uh, in Pittsburgh, and when we first went in to examine them in 1972, uh, they had this uh, great big huge black book, and they, what it was was a, was a, uh, was a cross of, of, of all transactions for all the different 10 or 12 funds that they had. And, uh, and of course, it made our job a lot easier because we were able to. But this is an example of one of those in-house records that they kept. And, uh, and their controller was amazed. He kept, he said, uh, you know, the fact that we spent so much time going over this book. And, and he said, nobody ever looks at it. What do you want to look at the book for? And, and so, oh, you know, well, we're just looking at it. <laughs> uh, they don't keep that book anymore. <laughs> I'm not surprised. For, for I just might add, you know, for a good uh, uh, explanation or, or or writing that that concerns itself solely with scalping, you might want to read uh, uh, SEC v. Capital Gains Research, which uh, goes not only into scalping but also defines it and uh, refines it and uh, tells the reader of the article the the evils. Uh, uh, about that kind of uh, activity. That's a Supreme Court case. Uh, now, let's continue. Okay. On the same point, uh, not to belabor it, but I would encourage the examiner, when you see a situation where you think you have a computer system and you think it might be able to help you, uh, it doesn't hurt to ask. Because generally, I think it's safe to say that the sooner they can get rid of you, the, the happier they are. And if you ask them nicely and don't demand it, you know, in two minutes, it's very possible that they may have a record or a, a already existing report that you ha haven't discovered yet, or they may be able to prepare <coughs> one very simply and uh, put it, put all the information you need in one place. Uh -huh. They're not going to give it to you gratuitously, though, usually. I think that uh, these four gentlemen know a lot more about inspecting than I do. Certainly, uh, they've all had much more experience than I have. But isn't it true, gentlemen, that... Uh, uh, Generally speaking, if you ask nicely for things, that you can get a lot more than than uh, than if you use uh, a, a, a rather official demand for stuff. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, uh, has that been your experience, Mike? I, I think the best the best approach to take is is to give them the impression, which I think is a correct impression, that you're out to learn what's going on in their operation. Don't make them think that you're coming in like gangbusters and trying to close them down. Don't make them think that you're pursuing a, some sort of a serious violation. Uh, spend the first three or four days learning the operation and try and create uh, as good a rapport with them as possible. And I, in most cases, they will try and help you to a large extent. Okay. I, I just second that. Or third at whatever. Has that uh, been in your experience? Oh, sure. Sure. And in auditing. I mean, even if you're employed uh, as an accountant by the people, uh, they have a little bit more control over you than uh, 
if you're coming in from a governmental agency, but niceness always counts. Uh, the, this is on a routine inspection now. The tenor may be completely different on an investigation, but we're talking about inspection. Yeah. Every, every once in a while, you're going to get somebody that's just going to be nasty, and, and sure. if you do, you just be thankful for all the other ones that, that they weren't. And uh, but you if can't you, be nasty back. But if you, no, just, if you, you know, I mean, we're not there to be liked. We're there to do a job, and it's it's. Uh, you know, I was on the, the other side of it at one time, and uh, uh, I just never, ever like to see somebody from the SEC come walking through the door, or from any regulatory agency for that matter. And, uh, you know, when, some, when somebody tell when I go into an examination and somebody says, oh, gee, I'm so glad to see you, I, I just really have to chuckle to myself because <laughs> the last person in the world that he wants to see is you. And uh, so you just have to be prepared for that, that's all. Okay. One last comment on the securities ledger. Uh, there is a notation required if there's any uh, restriction on the saleability of that security. That's a, you know, one place you could look to see if the fund had any restricted securities. That would be very rare now, except to maybe an SBIC. But it might be coming up as the, as the market is rising, the conditions, uh, the conditions change, and we may get into a bull market with speculative securities again. And... Uh, the restricted securities may that have left us may come back, uh, and we, we will have that problem. Some of the other separate ledger accounts that we can just run through very quickly in the few minutes we have remaining on this tape is uh, a separate one for the bro each broker dealer, each bank or other person uh, that uh, deals with the fund and portfolio securities. Uh, Separate ledgers, uh, which may be kept by the transfer agent, uh, for each shareholder account, uh, showing all the activity. Uh, most commonly, I guess this would be kept by the transfer agent. Is that your experience? Yeah. I mean, very. You know. Now, you had in your office uh, uh, in the late '60s a, a real problem with respect to shareholder accounts, didn't you, Frank? We sure did. And uh, you might uh, you might uh, indicate that. Uh, what that problem was and, and how it impacted on, on the capital account. I guess it all started Three minutes. when we tried to reconcile the capital account of a particular investment company and uh, we just couldn't quite get the numbers to agree and we wanted to know why so uh, we decided at this point to go physically to the to the transfer agent itself, who was in another state at the time, was in Boston. We get up there, and lo and behold, we started to open drawers, and we found securities, certificates, requests for redemptions, the likes of which I've never seen before. And uh, to make a long story short, they tell us we only have a few minutes left. It resulted in a very substantial uh, recovery. Uh, in terms of dollars and cents. Even to this day, they, isn't it true? Uh, this is value line, isn't right. it? And even to this day, they, 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 they still don't know who their shareholders oh. are. Uh, every one of their shareholders. And they have a pool of money so that when somebody comes in for a redemption, if he's not on the books and he can verify the fact that he bought the securities, they'll, they'll redeem them. Right. But they don't really know who he is. They never were able to clear it up. That pool of money originally came from the advisor, right? Who wanted yeah. to keep on selling. Yes, and then he, he recovered against he the sold. Uh, the uh, he sold uh, the uh, the investment. Uh, the uh, agent was ICSC right. in Boston, and uh, well, this wasn't the only time. And we've had the, we. This was we've almost all over the country, yeah. wasn't it? Right. Well, Wellington had the same problem during the same period of time. Yes. This is in the late '60s. Yeah. They, well, this is I what think was not a little better shape than that. Though. The, the, this was the paper crunch uh, uh, of the late '60s. Fortune. They they now hope that com that computer as a, as a opposed to the quill pen will. Will uh, will eliminate this. So far, we, have you had any back office problems now, Frank? No, not at all. How about you? No. Okay, we'll we'll wait for the next tape. Thank you.